All right, good morning. So I hope everybody had a good weekend. Um, let me mute my people logging in notification. All right. Um, yeah, good morning. So um, any questions? So my plan this week is to talk about, um, well, talk about the midterm first because people are asking about that. So yeah, so your midterm is Friday. It's going to be held during class. It will take the form of an online quiz. So the quiz will open up at 11, at uh, 10 o'clock Friday morning, um, and you'll have 50 minutes to, uh, to complete it. It will be um, a combination of short answer questions um, and programming assignments. So you'll definitely be writing code. Um, some of it will be in Bash, some of it will be in C. Um, a lot of it will be short sections of code, right? I might say, you know, code a function which does this or show um, a Bash script which does that. And... Um, I'm not going to ask you to do something, you know, like write a, um, a 20 sticks game, right, as part of the exam. Um, think more along the lines of the ODPs, right? Take something which takes in a command line argument, does some processing, converts it to an integer, and prints something out in response. Or a function that takes a string and does some manipulation and returns something. Or a bash script which, which looks for a certain kind of argument and does something in response. Basic interactions with with um, with either you know shell scripting or C, um, relatively simple algorithms, um, stuff like that. Um, I'm going to ask you to do this without using a compiler. Obviously, without using any online resources, no web searches, things like that. You can use your textbook. You can use your notes. Um, you can use your old code, because those are probably part of your notes. Um, but I'm not going to ask you to do things that I've already asked you to do on an ODP or on a, a homework assignment. So it's going to be similar to those things, but different. Um, and you'll, you'll, for code, you'll be typing up code in whatever editor you like and then pasting it into Canvas. Okay? Do not rely on Canvas for your entire midterm exam. Canvas is really easy to get kicked out of. If you hit the backspace key at the wrong point, if you hit a tab followed by a space bar, um, things like that, Canvas can, can boot you out. It can take you back to a different page and so on. And if all of your work on the midterm is being typed into Canvas um, and Canvas goes away, you might lose your entire midterm, right? So, so I'm going to recommend um, on the exam, but also right now, that you do all of your typing in, you know, Notepad or um, or some other editor of your choice, and then copy and paste into Canvas. Okay, so that if something goes wonky on Canvas, you still have you know the stuff you originally typed, and you can paste it back in quickly. Let's see. Are we using the system we use in our first week of classes, or solely Canvas? Um, I don't remember what the system was the first week of classes, but yeah, you're using Canvas. Um, it'll it'll look like a Canvas quiz. Um, not sure what else I can tell you about that. I haven't written the exam yet. Um, I have no idea what exactly I'm going to put on there. So I'll figure that out in the next few days. Other questions about the midterm? And we have a question about command line arguments, which I'm very happy to go over.
Paranoid. I will also give you your next programming assignment on either Wednesday or Thursday. I'll get that to you before the midterm so that you have um, a full week to work on it. And I'm pretty sure that's also going to be a C programming assignment. And then the one after that will go back to Bash. All right, let's talk about um, command line argument processing in C. Um, so, so the famous or dreaded argc argv. All right, so um, you write your main program. Your main program is always called main. It can return an end. It can return a void. It's up to you. If you want to process command line arguments, you have to have two arguments in the main function. The first one is an integer. second is a car star star. All right, whatever you call your file, let's say this is sitting in something called stick.c. And let's say I compile it eventually to an executable called stick. So that's my command line prompt for now is the percent sign. So if I say stick and I just hit an enter, so this is today's symbol for enter, it's just an arrow pointing down, right? So if I just say stick and I follow that immediately by the enter key or maybe some spaces, right? Then argc will be equal to one which tells me I only typed one thing on the command line and that one thing will be the first element of argv and it'll be the string stick because that's what I typed on the command line if I say stick 23 enter argc will be 2 argv bracket 0 will be stick argv bracket 1 will be the string 2, 3. Etc. I'll do one more. That's all there is to know about argc and argv and command line arguments, right? Declare your main function like this with an integer and a car star star. The integer tells you how many things you typed on the command line, one, two, three. That's the value of that first argument. And the second argument is an array of strings. How many things are in that array? Argc many things. How many things are in that array? The number of things you typed on the command line, which is the same as argc. Stick 23, two things, two things in the array. argc is two. And the contents of that array are the things you typed on the command line. So if you typed stick 23, the first element of the array is stick, the second argument of the array is 23. That's a really simple mechanism for passing command lines to your program. What's not so simple is knowing how to use that, right? Being able to take that and, and use it in your code to implement whatever, whatever algorithm you're after. And I don't know if someone's asking a question or not, but their microphone is on, but it's coming out as just a bunch of buzzing. So if you're trying to ask a question with your mic right now, pop it in chat and let me know. All right, so we got a question about difference in cars, but um, let me go back a bit. So uh, it doesn't have to be specifically argc or argv, right? Those are just variables. 
plain old variables, you can call them whatever you want. And you could call this count, you could call this arguments. Um, makes no difference as long as you're consistent in the usage. Um, so, um, so to use this, for example, in our, our stick picking game, um, pseudocode helps, right? Or a flowchart or something like that. Um, so, so during homework four, I didn't realize we needed the main function to accept both argc and argv. I was just doing argv. I don't remember that. I don't remember your submission just using argv. Um, so, so if you don't pay attention to argc, how do you know if the person said this or this or that? Right, so if the person says this, that's an error, exit immediately. If the person does this, take this as the number of sticks. If the person does this, you have to ask how many sticks. Well, how do you know which case you're in unless you check argc? And if argc is equal to 1 and you try to check, you know, the string length of argv bracket 1, you will seg fault. And if you try to s scan f argv bracket 1 as an integer and there is no argv bracket 1, your program will seg fault. So you always, always, always check this before you ever do anything with argv. And the only values of argv you can check are 0, 1, up to and including argv bracket argc minus 1. All right, you never want to look at argv indexed by argc or anything bigger. And so, so the algorithm, a possible algorithm for homework four would have been, um, you know, if argc is bigger than two, put in an error message and get out of there. If argc equals one, um, parse, sorry, equals 2, parse argv bracket 1. If not illegal, int bigger than or equal to 10, print an error message and exit. All right, so too many arguments, you're done. One command line argument after the name of the program, that means argc is 2, Check that argument, argv bracket 1. See if it's an integer and if it's bigger than or equal to 10. If it's not a legal int or if it's not bigger than or equal to 10, print an error message, exit. Okay. Um, otherwise, you're guaranteed argc is equal to 1 because argc can't be 0. It's not bigger than 2. It's not equal to 2. It's got to be equal to 1. So now, ask for a number of sticks to play with. If not a legal int bigger than or equal to 10, print an error and exit. Otherwise, play the game. All right, so that's your basic startup. We went through this last week, almost in this exact form. Um, and so this is this is a guide for how you use argc and argv, right? Also, if you write things out like this, you start to notice, hey, this and this, those look pretty much the same, right? Maybe I can make a function to do that. So let me tell you, most people totally went with writing a lot of different functions to do these different pieces of the game. That was fantastic. Okay. Normally I'm, I'm begging and pleading people, you know, please break your code into functions, modularize it. Right. Most people are doing that already and doing it really well. So that's, that's fantastic. Um, that was, that was really nice to see. Um, keep thinking in that direction, right? Cause that will make even more and more sense as we go forward. All right, um, all right.
right, let's look at these differences in in characters. Um, so somebody asked, what's the difference between Car Star, Car Space Star, and Car Star Star? So Car Star parameter and Car Star space parameter exactly the same. Okay, no difference to the compiler. They're both saying parameter is a pointer to a character. Okay, so um, technically it's a pointer to a car, but we also think of that as a string. It's also an array of cars, because that's what arrays are. They're pointers to things of that type. But car star star is different. And I think of it like this. Right? So visually, I sort of split it up. Car star space star param. Well, the star says an array of these things, which are strings. So car star star param says param is an array of strings. All right, so if we just say car star param, param bracket zero is a character, right? It's a pointer to a character. If we say car star star param, param bracket zero is basically a string. Okay, it's it's a pointer to a pointer. In fact, let's well let me run through a few more questions and then let's take a look at that in um, inside the debugger. All right, so that's the basic difference between those. Um, yeah, yeah, car star and car space star are actually exactly the same to the compiler. Okay, cool. All right, so yeah, um, so homework four, um, good work, everybody. Um, most of the point deductions were variations from the program description, okay? And, and at some level, it's silly, right? If you can write a, a sticks game, but your error handling is different from what I specified, right? You still know how to write the sticks game. Um, that's still worth a lot of the credit. But as I said before, part of the goal of these assignments is to get um, in the practice and get better at um, being able to look at uh, program specification and being able to test our code and make sure that it does what the specification says. Um, and so, so I was looking for very specific things like, you know, if the person puts in a bad number of sticks to take, um, don't just, you know, parse that as a zero. Um, or, or some other number, call them out and say, hey, you've got to put in an integer between one and four, ask them again, and don't give up on them. Let them do that as many times as it takes to get a valid answer. On the other hand, if you ask them how many sticks they want to play with in the beginning of the game, they only get one chance. And if they put in a bad number, if they put in something that's not a number, if they just hit the enter key, um, tell them that's not a valid answer and end the game. So those, those details were important, right? Um, and there was sample code that we went through um, on the server to look at those those different situations. So definitely pay attention to to um, to the details, and you know you can always ask, um, which some people did. Um, do you have to do this and that and so on and so forth? Um, what else can I say about homework four? Um, coding styles look good. Um, 
can always do more commenting. So, so I generally saw at least, you know, comments in the beginning of functions. Um, but, you know, commenting every line is not excessive sometimes. Um, definitely put your names in your code. So I got some assignments without that. And I already said before I wasn't going to take off points for commenting this time. But I'll start getting more uh, insistent on commenting going forward. Um, all right, so let's see. So let me mention a, um, a second C reference that I've uh, put a point or two on Canvas. So it's this book called I Can See Clearly Now. Um, and this is, this is intended as a um, kind of a bridge between, say, CSE 121 and CSE 222 that we're going to in winter. Um, and it, it talks about a lot of the things that we've been talking about and things we'll, we'll be going over in the future. Um, the first real chapter, chapter two, is talking about input and parsing, the idea of breaking your input into F gets followed by S scan F, right? And, and I still saw some people who weren't doing that. They were just using uh, S scan F, but not checking the return value. And you can get away with that in here because zero is an illegal value, but that, that can get you in trouble. Um, and I saw a number of people using scan F instead of S scan F, and that generally throws you into an infinite loop if there's an input error. So this talks about, about those kinds of things. Um, it's a short book. These chapters are, you know, a few pages, um, but it, it kind of goes through the stuff we've been talking about, but in written form. Um, string processing, we're going to be getting into probably next week. State-based programming, probably not until spring. Um, but pointers, we're going to start getting into. We've already started talking about that with like argc, argv, and so on. So there's there's some pages here that that um, that go over some of the ins and outs of pointers. Um, bit flipping, if you've done engineering 270 with me, we've gone through that. But it, it comes in to see. Recursion will be done in, in winter. Um, we're going to talk about make files and include files um, uh, today, probably. Um, and then uh, the last chapter here, 10, is, is about coding style and commenting. And that's probably worth a, a quick read. Um, same with chapter nine on gotchas. These are, are things that don't affect the correctness of your program's execution, but things to think about, things that can help you um, have more success while you're writing your code, while you're testing it and debugging it and so on and so forth. Um, we got some good C puns going on <laughs> in the chat. Um, so this is this is this is posted on on Canvas and feel free to download it and and look through it at your leisure. Um, it's not something to read cover to cover. It's certainly not something to like you know study for the midterm. With it's it's higher order than that. It's kind of general guiding principles. When you have some time, um, you know, or if you're struggling with make files or pointers or something like that. Um, Flip through it, see if it's useful. It's got tons of typos in there. I, I wrote it in a rush last year. I never got around to the typos. So um, if you find typos, let me know, but don't be surprised. But anyway, that's that's a reference that's out there um, for what it's worth. All right, let's... Um, Let's take a look at car star stars again. And by the way, I think I'm not going to do any ODPs this week. Okay, I'm going to give you a bit of a break, let you uh, get ready for um, the midterm. Plus, you know, it's midterm season in other courses as well, I'm sure. Um, but we'll go back to ODPs next week when we start digging into string processing in earnest. Um, but I think I'll take a break from them this week. So let's um, let's take a look at car star star. All right. 
that. So here's a glorious piece of code. Um, this will do all kinds of amazing things. So this doesn't run anything, okay? It sets a variable to 12 and it exits. Um, but I'm declaring a main program with argc argv. What I want to do is I want to compile this using the debug switch, and then I want to run this in the debugger GDB. Um, we're going to spend a lot of time later this course, next spring, next uh, winter, working in the debugger. So this is kind of our first foray into it. But I want to use the debugger just to look at this, this business of argc argv a little more closely and see what we can tell from it. So I'm doing this without a safety net, so we'll see what happens. Um, so I'm going to say gcc-g, the dash g switch says um, turn on debugging. Okay, so... That includes debugging information in the final executable. Um, oh, that didn't appear. Interesting. Um, so gcc-g-o main main.c. All right. Let me see. Interesting. All right. Um, So if I say main, this is fun, right? Nothing happens. We don't expect anything to happen. Okay, I'm going to run this in the debugger. Um, so um, GDB main. And if I would normally run this program by saying main, I'm going to say GDB in the name of my executable main instead. And it's going to start running this program in this very controlled environment. Okay. So, so, what's, what's a debugger about? Um, and if you've done Engineering 270, MP Lab is, is basically something that has a debugging environment. When you're simulating your code and stepping through and looking at the values of file registers and so on, you're using a debugger. Okay, we can do this in, in any language we want. We can do this in C. Um, the standard debugging tool in C is called GDB. Um, and what does this let us do? It lets us single step our code. So we can say, let's execute one instruction at a time. It lets us examine the value of variables, or more generally, the contents of memory. Now, because we compiled with the dash G switch, it knows about like variable names and function names and things like that. So I can say print the value of I, but I can also just say examine this location in memory. And we're going to do both of those things right now. Um, it also lets us set breakpoints. So if we know that something bad happens down here at line 97 of our code, we can set a breakpoint at line 97. We can tell our code to run, and when it gets to line 97, it'll stop. And it'll come back and say, what do you want to do? And we can check the values of variables, we can look at memory, we can see what the environment looks like, and figure out why line 97 is doing something wrong, or something that we didn't want it to. And so it lets us do, do execution of our program in a controlled way. Okay. So I'm going to say list, and I can see my program, and it's got five lines of code. I'm going to put a breakpoint at line 12. So when it gets to this, this um, okay, well, I'm going to say start first of all. Okay, so I've got a breakpoint at line two. Um, all right, so I'm, I'm running my main program, and it's telling me right now argc is one, argv is this big, long number. Um, argc is one because it thinks I'm running this program with just the word main. Okay, so argc is one tells me I have one command line argument, which should just be main. And argv is this number, this location. Okay, so if I say examine in hex what's at that location... I find the following, 7FFF, FFFF, EDCF. 
All right, so let's let's start a memory map. And actually, I'm going to move this into my other window. So that we can do this together. So argv is um, 7fff bunch of stuff eb b8 okay at that location in memory so here's our memory map okay at this location in memory ebb8 what do we find we find this 7fff fffff EDCF. All right. So argv is a pointer to memory. Well, we find that that location in memory is not a string. We find another pointer. Okay. That's the star star. argv is a pointer to a car star, a pointer. So this 7FFF EDCF should be a pointer to a character. So let's see what's stored at that location in memory. So let's examine that. So EDCF, what do I find there? I find 6D, 6F, 6E, 2F. Six eight two F. And at the next locations in memory I find six nine six E two F six five and some other stuff. All right, so instead of examining in hex, let's examine as a character. What do I find? I find a slash H-O-M-E slash N-I-C-K slash work to slash M-A-I-N and an all terminator. All right, so argv is this address in memory. At that address, I find another address. At that other address, I find the name of my program, which is slash home slash nick slash work to slash main with a null terminator. Okay, that's what argv bracket one is, bracket zero is. All right, so this is argv bracket zero. Right, and at that location, I find the actual value of the first string on the command line. All right, so let's let's run this with a command line argument. And so I'll start again. So, so I'm running this with the command line arguments. This is a test. And I stopped inside my program just before I said i equals 12. And it's telling me that I'm inside this function called main. And main was called with two arguments, an argc, which was 5, and an argv, which was eb98. All right. Well, we expected argc to be 5 because we ran main with 
four arguments, this is a test, and so the name of the program main is the first argument followed by this is a test. All right, so let's, let's make a memory map of this. So argc equals five, argv equals seven ffff, eb nine eight. And so in memory, and I'm going to skip the seven FFFs for now. I'm just going to do EB98. Okay, that's the value of argv. That's supposed to be a car star star. It's supposed to be a pointer to an array of strings. So let's see what's stored at that location in memory. And it looks like I did something wrong. Oh, um, I'm looking one byte at a time right now. Okay. So, so when you examine it, remember is the last thing you examined. I was examining a character at a time, so it was showing me one byte at a time right now. So I did a W to say examine a word in hex starting at this location. And so it shows me 7FFF EDC0. All right, so what's stored here is EDC0. And I'm on a 64-bit machine. You've got to know that. So this is is actually eight bytes, right? 64 bits wide. So the for each pointer is 64 bits. Okay, that's a double word, basically. Yeah. So um, so at the location pointed to by argv, I find these 64 bits, which is seven fff. EDC zero, and my next location in memory is going to be um, EB A zero, and at EB A zero, I find the following sixty four bits seven F F F F F F F E D D six. And the next sixty four bytes bits begin at EBA8 and at that location I find 7FFF EDDB and the next 64 bits begin at EBB0 and at that location I find 7FFF EDDE And the next 64 bits start at EBB8. And at that location, I find 7FFF EDE0. And the next 64 bit address is a 0. All right, this is what our memory looks like. Argv is pointing right here. And what do we find there? One, two, three, four, five pointers, followed by a null. So argv is an array of pointers. What's an array? It's just a succession of data values stored one after another in memory. Well, if it was an array of characters, it would be character, character, character. If it was an array of ints, it would be int, int, int. This is an array of pointers, so it's pointer, 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 pointer. So this, argv bracket zero, is the address 7fffffedc zero. Argv bracket one is the address, all of that stuff, EDD six, and so on.
So let's just look at EDD6, which is this location right here, RV bracket 1. Let's see what's stored at the location that this is pointing to. And it's the letter T, followed by an H, followed by an I, followed by the S, followed by an all terminator. So elsewhere in memory, we have a location EDD6. And at that location in memory, we find THIS followed by a null terminator. And what comes after that null terminator? Well, the next address is EDDB. So this was EDD678. Nine, A was the null terminator, and B is the letter I, followed by an S, followed by a null terminator. And the next location is E, D, D, E, and that's the letter A, followed by a null terminator. And then the next location will be E, D, E, zero. And that'll have T, E, S, T, and an alternator. All right, so what does all this mean, right? This is, this is what argc, argv are doing at the hardware level. This is the metal, right? Argv is an address, 64 bits. It points to somewhere in the memory of the machine. At that location in the memory, we find a 64-bit address. And at that address, we find the word THIS followed by an alternator. The 64 bits following this first address contains another pointer. And at that location, we find the second word that we put on the command line IS. Right. So this is an array of 64-bit pointers all packed together one after another. And these could be pointing anywhere, right? But, but since our arguments are strings, the compiler and the operating system pack these strings next to each other so they just occur in successive locations, right? Um, and then we just have pointers so we know where each of these strings begins. And we know where they end because strings end with a null terminator. Okay, that's what's going on when you're doing argc, argv. If you were doing this in assembly language, right, you would have to take all of this apart yourself. You would have to come here, and if you wanted the third argument, you'd have to add three times eight and add that to this address to find the address where the third argument is, and then go to that location and pull off, you know, the letter A followed by an all terminator. Again, if you've done 270, this is what's going on with indirect file registers. You would load this into file select register 0, and then if you looked at INDF 0, you would get this. You'd load that into file select register 1, and then INDF 1 would refer to the letter T. And then if you did a plus W0, you could increment W0 in a loop until plus W1 was equal to null terminator. And that would let you iterate through your memory. So it's an array of pointers pointing to their own words, basically. Yeah, basically. Um, it's an array of addresses, right? Where each address is the location where the corresponding argument begins. We're going to go wild on this stuff in 222, okay? We're going to be spending a lot of our time down at this level because we're going to be building things called data structures. And data structures are like integers or arrays, but more pieces to them. And we'll build, you know, an entire data structure out of nothing. And it will basically be things pointing to other things that point to other things that have three fields where the first one's an integer and the second one is is a character and the third one is a pointer to another one of these things. Um, so yeah, that's CSE 222.
Um, and that's, that's a lot of fun, right? Once, once you understand how to manipulate the hardware at that level, there's nothing you can't do, right? That's, that's as good as assembly language in most ways in terms of being able to have complete control over um, where your data goes and what happens to it and what you look at. And that's where all the good stuff that we do and see that, you know, in comparison seems really easy. That's where that all sort of percolates up from. All right. So this is not something I'm going to ask you to, like, you know, understand or work with on the exam. Okay. This is a, a sort of first glance at something that's going to be a broader topic um, over the coming weeks, which is working with a debugger. But just kind of as a first exposure. Um, it's not all just random, right? There's a reason why argv bracket one gets us here and argv bracket two gets us there and so on. And we'll, we'll eventually be good at understanding those things at the hardware level, partially by using GDB. All right, so, so questions, comments about that? All right, well, um, Friday we, we left off by talking a little bit about um, taking code and breaking it into pieces. Um, and I want to continue that theme. I want to take a program, break it into pieces, and then break those individual functions into separate files, and look at how we can compile those efficiently, and then talk about make files. And make files are how we can tell um, somebody how to take these pieces of code in separate files and put them together into an executable. Um, and starting with the next programming assignment, if it's in C, I'm going to ask you to turn in make files, and I'm going to want to see good, efficient make files. So we're going to talk about what that means. Um, but make files are another one of these things that you'll kind of be expected to know how to do once you get to a university. So we want to make sure we nail those down. I also want to talk a little more about Git. Um, and I'm starting to get questions from people about sort of how to keep two repositories in sync. Like if you want to work on your project from home, but also want to work on it on the Linux server, how can you keep um, two repositories in sync? And the answer is you can do it by using GitLab, right, or GitHub, um, or whatever your favorite cloud is. Um, and you, you keep your pristine copy of code in the cloud, and when you want to work on it, you pull down the current copy, you make your changes, and when you're done, you push your changes back up. And then if you switch to another machine and you want to work on your code, you just pull down the latest copy, make your edits, push it back up. And by always keeping your, your sort of latest up-to-date copy on, say, GitLab, right, you can, you know, you're stuck on a plane with your phone, you can pull your phone out and, and hit the web server and, you know, run a Git app and pull down your code and make some edits and push it back up and go from there. So it lets you have sort of one central location, but you can work on your code and access your code from anywhere. Um, and that's really useful. All right, so that is 10.50. We are out of time. Um, I will see you next time.